Are you game? I am. Bruce Shelley's career began alongside one of his biggest idols. That was sort of his trial by fire. He got a chance to hang out with one of the great game designers in PC gaming history. Success followed, yet he followed his heart and left the business he loved. So I was out of the industry, essentially, and no one knew who I was. In a sense, I had no profile. And an old acquaintance lured him back. And I told my wife, I said, I think he's going to start a game company. I said, go for it. An ensemble of talented people pegged their hopes on a challenging game based on history. I suppose it might have been too hard for the casual gamer. But the game earns the devotion of players almost from the start. The first game was one of those ideas that you kind of slap your forehead and go, why the hell didn't anybody else think of this? And the quiet game developer faced his fears. We did push Bruce into the role of the spokesperson, and it was because he was uncomfortable with that role that he's perfect for that role. He impressed others from the beginning. He's not a BS artist, and never has been. He was just a, a joy to work with. He was almost like my twin brother in a lot of ways. This is the story of the man behind the Age of Empires phenomenon. It's the compelling story of Bruce Shelley. Bruce Shelley, the man who would make and relive history with his innovative video games, began life in a very typical Chicago family. Both my parents were teachers, and my mother was a stay-at-home mom until my middle brother and I were old enough to walk to school on our own. I came out of my childhood really excited about reading and playing games. I remember thinking as a kid that I loved rainy days because all the kids had to do what I wanted to do, which was play games. The Brainy Kid is also incredibly well-rounded. I played sports in college and at the high school level. I, you know, I was a Boy Scout. I really enjoyed scouting, outdoors experience, the leadership opportunities that was important, and then college fraternity life. I think by the time I got through those three experiences, I was pretty much who I am today. But all the pop flies in the world can't replace his love for games. I discovered that playing a good game was the most intellectually intense thing that I'd ever done. Bruce heads to grad school and hooks up with a couple of buddies who not only share his interests, but will help change the course of his life. We met at a war game club together where we played historical, you know, and strategy games, board games before the age of computer games. I just remember treating them with respect and taught them games and, and welcomed them as part of the community. It was all kinds of age groups and people at this club. He was always the center of attention. I was just a kid from junior high school who came there to play games. And this college club gets Bruce one step closer to civilization. He'd just be sending his yellow pads just full of game notes, everything he thought, and in, into these game companies. And so that's just my basically my first memory of him. Actually, I helped start a company called Iron Crown Enterprises in Charlottesville, Virginia. There was friends of mine in a game club at the University of Virginia. I traveled to game shows and helped them sell their products. And we just all did it for free, and that job led to the next. Shelley lands one of his first real gigs as a professional board game designer with Avalon Hill in 1980. He finds success, but his creative side becomes restless. I was working for a board game company in Baltimore, Maryland, and one of my friends introduced me to a game called Pirates. People asked me what was the game that most influenced me getting into interactive gaming, and it was Pirates on the Commodore 64. The young game designer is so inspired, he makes a bold move. I thought it was an incredible game. It wasn't so much that I wanted to make that game myself. It was the fact that I wanted to work for a company that made products like that. I said, now this is what the future of gaming is gonna be. Shelley sets his sights on a job with Microprose, the game company led by gaming genius, Sid Meier. I lobbied for that job for like a year, and I finally uh, I got the job I went to work for him. The young protege finds himself side by side with one of his idols. That was sort of his trial by fire. You know, he got a chance to hang out with one of the great game designers in PC gaming history. He prototypes by himself. He does his own art, does his own programming, and he brought me into that process. He was just a, a joy to work with. He was almost like my twin brother in a lot of ways. He gave me a lot of support, a lot of ideas. The games really wouldn't have been the same without him.
I, we have to understand our working relationship. Basically, the two of us worked together almost, ex you know, by alone. It was like uh, there was a joke in the company that one that one group of people called us the A team. He could kind of handle things that I didn't have time to, to work on. Left me free to do the programming and a lot of the creative stuff. So we made a good a good team. Working with him was like going. I've described that as going to Game Design University. I mean, it was more than just making games. It was it was considering and analyzing the process. The game god and his disciple produce a number of home runs. The first is Railroad Tycoon. If you read the credits of the game, they say, by Sid Meier with Bruce Shelley. I, I just felt that that was my role. You know, he was a star. The strategy game Civilization is released in 1992 for the PC, led by designer Sid Meier. And on his wing is Bruce Shelley as co-designer. In the game, each player is given 6,000 years to turn a wandering tribe into a technologically developed society. <laughs> Civilization is touted as the most open-ended and flexible computer game ever developed. And gaming fans around the world hope this dynamic duo will last forever. He worked with Sid for a while and in a lot of ways I think was sort of groomed to be his heir or protege. But another side of Bruce's life begins to take priority. What happened was my wife was uh, an executive with Citibank, and she made a lot more money than I said. Her salary was like three times mine. And um, there was a contraction in the mortgage industry, and, and she did not want to move back to St. Louis, so she left her job. And we started looking for a new job for her, and it turned out the best opportunity that came for her was in Chicago. And in 1992, Bruce Shelley leaves one first love for another. So we made the decision that I would leave Microprose and go with her to Chicago, and then I would look for something else to do. So he leaves designing behind and tries his hand at writing. And I said, you know, I think I could do that. I've written all these 200-page manuals. I think I can write a strategy guide. And the, the publisher said, this is a great idea. We've never had a real person with game design experience write these books. The game genius finds it hard to hide his intelligence. If the game was good, then it was a lot of fun. Um, it was interesting to look and see what they've done. Shelley finds himself slipping further away from the business and later makes a decision that will take him away from the person he loves the most. So I was out of the industry, essentially, and no one knew who I was. I mean, in a sense, I had no profile. In 1994, Bruce Shelley, the co-creator of such hit games as Railroad Tycoon and Civilization, leaves his key job at Microprose and Sid Meier behind. He follows his heart and his wife to a new life. I was living in Chicago, and I was actually making a living as a freelance writer, writing strategy guides. And Tony Goodman is all grown up and ready to play. He had started a business consulting firm in Dallas, never given up the idea of someday having a game company. And he started calling me up uh, when I was in Chicago, and we'd have these two-hour phone conversations about, well, how do you make computer games? And I told my wife, I said, I think he's going to start a game company. And he did offer me an opportunity. He says, do you want to come and join us? She goes, well, this is crazy, you know, the game business and this kid, you know, who's going to want to start a company? This doesn't make any sense. Well, he knew Tony Goodman when Tony was in junior high. So when Tony got together some people, I said, go for it. But uh, she, she got on board with it. So in January of 1995, Bruce Shelley accepts Tony Goodman's offer and joins the new company, sliding into the position of senior designer and co-founder. Bruce isn't only half the brain behind launching the company. He also spends time developing a new mythology department. The company name is Ensemble Studios. It's a nod to the way the group makes their games together as one big happy family. We didn't have one Sid Meier. We had half a dozen guys who together brought the skills together that he had in one person. So we had to come up with a way to use six people to do what he had done as one person. Joining the cast at Ensemble in Dallas means leaving his wife behind in Chicago, but not for good. I go to Dallas at least once a month. A lot of the things I do, a lot of the writing and catch up on the game and do the team building things we do, do the play testing. And then I can also get quiet time away from all these meetings and, you know, do my own work at home. Everything about working with Bruce has just clicked from day one. I think he's amazing, the things that he does that I would never consider. Early on, we had no money. He was spending it. Very interested in marketing and the whole idea of get our face out there. And the boys become inspired to create a new game. Bruce really liked the idea of you know, doing a game about civilization. That's a topic that he had taken on before. 
but we wanted to do something in real time, which uh, as opposed to doing turn-based games. We had examined all the other games that in, our, in our space and what were they doing well, what, what was the bar that they had set, and where were the opportunities they left for us. There was lots of conversations about it. I said, you know, let's show what the history of Greece was about. You know, we had Jason the Argonauts and the Trojan War and things like that. A lot of people thought, well, historical games will never make it. Who's interested in history? If they wanted to learn history, they'd be at school and things like that. And how would you describe this new real-time strategy game? You're in the Stone Age, and the whole world is dark. It's mysterious. You have very little knowledge of what's happening in the world. And you have a small little village and a couple of people. And your goal is to turn this little tiny star into the first great civilization on Earth. And the name of the game is revealed. I know it went through several name iterations. It was uh, the rise of man, and it was called the Tribe. Age of Empires was the game that the name ultimately it shipped under, and that sort of stuck. Age of Empires, Ensemble Studios' first game, is released by Microsoft in 1997. Both gamers and critics are ecstatic. As soon as it went out the door, it just sold and sold. <laughs> we were real happy. The epic game spans thousands of years, in which the player is the guiding spirit in the evolution of a small Ice Age tribe. He's taken the real-time strategy model that was popularized by uh, Command and & Conquer and Warcraft and, and games of that nature. And I don't want to say he's added a layer of respectability to it, but he's, he's taken it into, into a more realistic context. And Microsoft benefits, too. After Age of Empires came out, people started to take Microsoft seriously as a gaming company. The game can be played in two to three hours, rather than the week or so required to finish a game of Civilization, and up to eight computers can be linked up to play. The artificial intelligence has been incorporated to ensure playing against the computer is also a bit of a challenge. Microsoft claims it's selling the game faster than they can ship it. Even though it's a game that takes hours and hours to play at each time, it, it, it did pick up a pretty huge casual audience and a, and a pretty big female audience that we weren't expecting. Age of Empires, the first game, was one of those ideas that you kind of slap your forehead and go, why the hell didn't anybody else think of this? You take real-time strategy, which is the hot vogue, and you give it a historical context. Age of Empires receives numerous awards, and by June 1998, Microsoft has shipped more than one million copies worldwide. And later that year, Age of Empires, The Rise of Rome, an expansion pack to the award-winning strategy game, is released. I think we felt it was demanding, and we worked hard in our follow-up games to, to make it easier for the, the people. So, I mean, we recognized it. It wasn't perfect. We said, oh, how can we top that? And so we said, oh, well, what's a bigger historical topic than ancients? And we said, well, medieval, that's the biggest topic. Uh, let's do a game about knights, kings, and castles. In the fall of 1999, Age of Empires II, The Age of Kings is released, along with vast improvements from the first game. Two spans 1,000 years from the fall of Rome to the Middle Ages. We need a mangonello ram to get through these walls. Look out! A battle rages ahead! Stay back! Bruce rips out the first game's AI engine and rewrites it. And what's the gameplay like in this one? I think Age of Empires II, The Age of Kings, is as close to perfect as we've ever gotten. I mean, our challenge is to make a game that good again someday. I mean, it all came together in that game. The art was improved significantly. We sort of had less of a Legoland approach or look to the game and more of a realistic scale and depth. And the crew from Ensemble does it again. The original AoE was a success, but it was actually AoE 2 that became a monster hit. That's where the series really took off. It was then that I first saw the girl. It wasn't an accident that we put a woman in the game, you know, as a character. Her name was Jean. Because, so, you know, we found out that women like playing age. So now there was a hero who was a female, who they could follow the career of this woman in our game. Bonjour, Jean. My colleague and I will escort you to the Chateau of the Dauphin, or else we will die trying. And it wasn't an accident that there was a French character and a German character. They were our two biggest international markets. And in the spring of 2001, Microsoft acquires Ensemble Studios. The Microsoft philosophy is really to get the best products in category, and they're not about just getting a huge roster of titles. It's really quality over quantity, 
and it's sort of cliche, but it's really in practice at Microsoft. And Ensemble is a leader in the RTS category. By the end of 2000, Age of Empires II, The Age of Kings, is number one on the holiday sales charts worldwide. And the expansion pack, Age of Conquerors, is also flying off shelves. But it's what Bruce Shelley and the group at Ensemble decide to do next that stuns fans. The Age of Empires 2 expansion pack is a massive international hit and an official game of the World Cyber Games. And the quiet man who helped create a phenomenon sees his PR role expanding rapidly. We did push Bruce into the role of the spokesperson and it was because he was uncomfortable with that role that he's perfect for that role. I think the first thing he has is just sort of unquestionable credibility. He's extremely popular across the world and all the subsidiaries from Microsoft are always asking for him to come on the road and demonstrate and show the product for them. It's turned out to be a real asset for the product, for the industry, for Ensemble and for Microsoft. He's not a BS artist and never has been. He's a very straightforward individual. He'll tell you what he thinks and he's tactful about it, but you get the straight, the straight boot. You know, I happen to be a huge fan of the Age of Empires series, and Bruce will be the first one to say they're not my games. It takes a whole team, you know, and he was always uh, careful to, uh, to comment on that. We talk about that all the time. No one succeeds by themselves. No matter what it is they do, and it takes a whole team to make something good, and a, a tremendous team to deliver something this tremendous. But for Bruce Shelley and his team, creating something truly historical would require making a drastic change. We felt that we really had to do something a little different. Um, we see it as like a fork from the H franchise, not necessarily a linear follow-up. We worked on it for three years straight. This is the longest project we ever, ever worked on. It's far more ambitious than anything we've ever done. So what will this new game be about? We wanted to rejuvenate the franchise, so we came up with the idea of doing fantasy. Everybody's doing fantasy games, so we came up with the idea of mythology. Well, it is an historically based game, a strategy game, where people are going to go in, they're going to try to build up their civilization. They're going to create peasants, gather wood, gather food, gather gold, and gather a fourth resource, which is favor, which is certainly unique to Age of Mythology over Age of Empires. Age of Mythology is Ensemble's most ambitious and perhaps enchanting game ever. There's a hero, Arkantos, and he's an admiral or a great hero from Atlantis, and he's called upon ostensibly to help out in the Trojan War on behalf of uh, his Greek friends. While he's on his way there and gets involved there, he encounters some really unusual things. The gods in the game have certain god powers like earthquakes and tornadoes and meteor strikes. Those are very offensive weapons. They're also defensive ones or economical ones, like rain. And based on your civilization, you'll also have access to different mythological creatures. Mythology is part of the human experience. It's not that great a departure from what we've done in the past. It's not completely historical, as closely historical as this other stuff we had. But I think a thousand years ago, people believed these gods were real. Behind the magic is something computer-driven, a new heavy-duty 3D engine. And officially, the work on the 3D engine began about five years ago. A 3D engine is the, is the centerpiece. It's the piece of technology that allows the game to run. In mythology, we took advantage of the 3D technology with our dramatic god powers, tornadoes and earthquakes. Impossible to do in a 2D game, but really cool looking and dramatic in 3D. The myth creatures are special attacks, um, flying units, underwater units. The combination of 3D technology and mythology just work together really well. When a god power is revealed and, you know, meteors fall or lightning crashes, that's not something you would ever really see in a historical game unless it was just a historical occurrence. But in an age of mythology, that would be something the player can control and make a decision on and, and get a lot of visceral feedback. The game features an organic musical score by incorporating unique acoustic instruments. and offers easy to play multi and single player modes. We've done a fantastic single player campaign that's unlike anything anybody's ever done in a real time strategy game. And for some fans of Age of Empires, it may feel somewhat familiar. If you're a fan of Age of Empires, you're gonna love this game because it builds on everything that made the other Age games terrific. 
intuitive gameplay, attention to detail, and historical flavor. Plus now you have the addition of these mythological creatures and god powers. And easier gameplay for all levels of players. It's a new game and it's really great to play. <laughs> Uh, it's got something for everybody. It really does. It's, it's easy to pick up, it's easy to learn. Uh, you get to see some really cool things. I mean, you don't often get a chance to, to drop a meteor on someone. In the fall of 2002, the game launches with a gala premiere. And the woman who was there from the very beginning makes an appearance. Well, I think it's really great. I think everybody worked so hard for this. I think they deserve this celebration. And that, of course, includes Mr. Bruce Shelley. Bruce Shelley is a really an incredible person because of the way that he looks at very simple means to deliver more exciting experiences. He approaches games as a gamer. He plays a lot of games, and so he's able to sort of relate to the gamer on a level that I think uh, some game designers can't. Bruce Shelley's the kind of individual who wants to you know, just wake up every day and say, what can I do today to be the best person for this company? Bruce is your best friend, basically. He's someone who's supportive, who, who doesn't have a negative thing to say. He commands the respect of his peers, and it has earned it. Bruce accomplished anything that he tries. I've been able to do the kind of thing I've loved to do my whole life, and it's turned into a really good thing. Ha, ha, ha.